Except for Sikhism, which cropped up in the 15th century, Islam was the last major religion to be founded and the religious landscape remained quite settled for about 1,000 years. There was Hinduism, which primarily dominated India, various forms of Buddhism in the Far East, Islam in the Middle East and Catholicism in Europe. To keep us focused and on track, we're not going to examine the other world's religions in any detail at the moment, but you will find if you explore them that the same themes keep coming up. For example, in Buddhism and Taoism, you'll find a concept called yin and yang, which represents the joining of the light male and dark female principles, and the concept of a life force that balances the two. You'll find that bulls are sacred in Hinduism, stemming from the ancient idea that Nimrod was represented by a bull. You'll find sex cults, fertility goddesses, sun worship, serpents of knowledge and ideas that we can attain godhood through our own efforts. It's repackaged and expressed differently across the world and given different names, but the basic themes and symbols are all there in some form or another. It's all coming from ancient Babylon. It's probably worth noting that Eastern forms of the mysteries are actually becoming very popular in our culture right now and are ensnaring even Christians. Although the filtering of Eastern paganism into Britain could be traced at least as far back as the East Indian Trading Company in the 17th and 18th centuries, the real explosion came when the Beatles went to India in the 1960s and suddenly Eastern mysticism became extremely fashionable. Over the past 50 plus years its popularity has been steadily growing in the West. Today for example we have yoga, reiki, Zen Buddhism, acupuncture, martial arts, meditation and feng shui to name just a few of the occult philosophies that grew out of Babylonian mysteries in the East and which have now been transported to us in the West. Because our culture is now so saturated with it, many Christians don't recognize when they're involved with something that has a satanic origin. For that reason, I have provided an occult checklist in the notes section of the Fuel Project Facebook page. If you are involved in anything listed there, I would strongly suggest you repent and renounce your involvement. For now, however, we're going to stay in Europe and continue our journey through time there. After the Roman Empire collapsed in the 5th century AD at the hands of Germanic barbarians, Europe entered the Dark Ages. The Catholic Church stepped into the power vacuum that had been created by the collapse of the Roman Empire and it quickly became the most powerful spiritual and political entity in the world. In the 8th century AD, a forged document was created called the Donation of Constantine. It stated that Constantine had bequeathed the Roman Empire to the Catholic popes and although it was found to be fraudulent in the 15th century, by then its work had already been accomplished. Legal authority over the kings of Europe was already in the hands of the Pope and the Catholic Church. It took a while to secure the new system in Europe, though. In the 7th century, the Pope went looking for a protector to defend Catholic territories. Pepin, the leader of the Franks, was chosen and he was bribed with a promise that if he cooperated in this mission, his place in heaven would be secured. Battles ensued for a while, but it wasn't until Charlemagne, Pepin's son, that the Pope's security was truly assured. Charlemagne was then crowned in Rome on the 25th of December 800 AD as the first emperor of the Holy Roman Empire. The Holy Roman Empire was seen to be a continuation of the old collapsed Imperial Roman Empire. This move shrewdly promoted popes to kingmakers who claimed their authority to do so because of the forged donation of Constantine and because of their connection to God. Later, the Catholic historian Tertullian wrote of that transaction that Our God no longer reigns. He has resigned all power over to the Pope. At the command of the Pope, Charlemagne went forth on many campaigns of conquest throughout Europe. All conquered lands and people came under the authority of the Catholic Church and Europe was united under their reign. Consequently, Charlemagne is now considered the father of Europe. The Catholic rule, however, although unified, was a dark, dark period in history. Anyone who did not willingly submit to the authority of the Church was persecuted and killed for heresy. European citizens were taxed heavily and were expected to spend their lives in the service of the Church. With worldly power, corruption kept growing. Pope Leo X began the process of selling indulgences as a way to extort money from the people. This means that he offered forgiveness of sins for a fairly small amount of money. For a little bit more money, you would not only be forgiven of a sin, but you would be allowed to carry on indulging in it. 
hence the name selling of indulgences. Also, through the invention of purgatory, you can now purchase the salvation of your loved one's souls in the Catholic system. The Church taught the ignorant masses, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the troubled soul from purgatory springs. Pope Leo X showed his true feelings when he said, The fable of Christ has been quite profitable to us. As a result of such corrupt behaviour, the Church became exceedingly rich. They played on fear to control and dominate and increase their wealth in the process. Before long, the Church dominated the political and cultural landscape. It was the most powerful institution in the world and the Pope the most powerful man. The Pope became the real spiritual authority behind the rulers of the world and he used religious persuasion to control nations for his own purposes. If kings acted against the wishes of the Vatican, the Pope could excommunicate them from the Church and therefore effectively sentence them to eternity in hell. This fear was enough to keep the kings of Europe in line with the Church's wishes. Once more we see that religious authority secures temporal authority. The Church also recognised a key principle to maintaining power. Control knowledge. Knowledge really is power. And so with this in mind, it endeavoured to block all independent learning and scientific progress. In this way, the people would be forced to depend on the Church's hierarchy for information and the dependency would consolidate the Church's power. This is primarily why the era has become known as the Dark Ages. In 500 AD, for example, the Bible was available in 500 languages. By 600 AD, the Catholic Church had restricted it to just one language, and that was Latin. Latin was already a dead language by this time, understood only by priests. In this respect, people became utterly reliant on the Catholic Church for information and knowledge about God. If the Catholic Church said something, people had no choice but to believe it and to act accordingly because they had no direct access to the Bible themselves. By keeping the population in ignorance and dependent on their instructions, the Church hierarchy could play them like puppets. This deliberate construction of a knowledge-based hierarchy is an occult trait. As Martha Ecclesburg said, Hierarchies make some people dependent on others, blame the dependent for their dependency, and then use that dependency as a justification for further exercise of authority. Throughout the Dark Ages, the corruption kept growing. Mary became more and more prominent, as did praying to and devoting herself to saints. The idea of sacraments, mandatory celibacy, monasticism, and the idea that the Pope was nothing less than infallible and God on earth. The Holy Roman Empire became a cesspool of depravity and corruption like the Imperial Roman Empire had been.